Hello everyone, it's Michael Lazar here, and welcome back to the channel. And before I begin today's video, I want to remind you guys that I'll be offering my intermediate Byzantine chant course this summer. The link to register is in the description down below. I highly recommend that you register. Not only is it a good price, but the quality of the material that will be taught will not only ensure that your current self will learn Byzantine well, but your future self will have the foundations and fundamentals to become a great chanter. So going along with Fundamentals Byzantine Chant, this video is a reflection of an idea that I've had for a long time. And the idea is that Byzantine chanters are not musicians, but they should be. So what do I mean by this? A lot of times in Byzantine Chant, it is a phenomenon that people think that learning the notes and rhythms is all you need. A lot of times especially because we have such a big volume of music, people tend to only look at the notes and rhythms when they're chanting. This not only goes against all the teachings of church fathers in regards to hymnography and psalmody, but also is laughable in the eyes of many musicians. If you look at a musician of the classical genre, jazz genre, if you look at oriental music, folk music, if you look at rock music, country music, some people might not like that, if you look at any of these genres of music, if you tell someone that you know the notes or rhythms of your piece, they will laugh at you. So what? <laughs> Everyone can play the right notes and the right rhythms. I can go on a computer software and find Rachmaninoff's uh, first piano concerto and play it from a computer. All the notes, all the rhythms will be correct. I could go take a Byzantine chant, plug it into a software, get the same thing. Correct notes, correct rhythms. So what? Chanting is not about singing the right notes and the right rhythms. It's about taking a text and adding music to it to amplify the text meaning and beauty. Whenever we have Byzantine chant that is simply looked at for just the notes and rhythms, we strip the music of its beauty and we strip the text of its beauty and meaning. We actually work backwards. And you know, a lot of people might say, oh, I don't try to do it. If you are not looking at Byzantine chant as a musical art form, you are subconsciously doing this. And the issue is that in the United States, the tradition of learning chant is a lot different than what it was in the past. In the old days, the way you would learn how to chant is you would have a teacher, a master, a protopsalty, who's been a master. And the proof is in the pudding. He has a very, very good style and quality to his voice. The protopsalties in a church are usually very highly trained, in the, in, at least back in Greece, or Lebanon, or the Middle East, or even if you go to Europe, you get the same thing. In the United States, because of a lack of resources, protopsalties, who protopsalties are put in quotes, because a lot of times it's out of necessity as opposed to actual um, qualifications, do not have the same shadowing experience. So what happens is that they have to learn from a plethora of resources online, which a lot of them are not only um, detrimental to their own technique as a chanter, but also don't teach them the correct style. Because likewise, the people who teach never had someone um, that's uh, taught them the correct style. Now you could argue that, hey, Michael, you're kind of, are you a hypocrite because you live in the United States? But I will say that, you know, my chant background has that lineage. My father learned from a master chanter, Elias Lamore, who is, if you don't know who he is, he is like um, Mitri Moore's son, and they said Elias is better than Mitri Moore. If you don't know Mitri Moore, he is uh, the guy who wrote a lot of the Arabic hymnography. So my dad learned from the best of the best. And who did I learn from? My dad. My dad is an uh, incredible chanter. So this tradition was passed from Mitri Moore to Elias Amor to my dad to me. So this is a very good timeline. This is how timelines for changes have always been. But in this new culture we have of the digital age, we don't have this. So what happens is that people say, I'm going to learn how to chant. So I'm going to learn how to read notation. Okay, good. I'm going to learn how to read scales. Okay, good. What about the style? What about ornaments? What about singing technique? In addition to learning from my father, I studied classical singing and opera for almost a decade. Um, actually, actually, I think it's been a decade now. But I have been singing professionally in addition to chanting, which I think 
is more of a blessing than anything because this has really taught me how to apply my voice correctly to the chanting, not to injure myself, and how to sound the best I can possibly sound. Obviously, I have a lot to grow, but still, whenever I'm chanting, I'm not just looking at notes and rhythms. I'm looking at all the small details. So, what is the solution here? The solution is to treat Byzantine chant like music. And what does treating music mean? My piano teacher um, in university, she told me that um, you need to treat music like the scriptures. You would not talk bad about the scriptures. You would not only look at the text of the scriptures. You need to look at the scriptures and see the sub-meaning, the details, how the current verse reading applies throughout the course of the Bible. If you look at music like the Bible, it makes so much more sense detail-wise, and it sounds so much more expansive and beautiful. So let me use this as an analogy. Making music, or at least singing a chant, or making any type of music, could be playing piano, playing guitar, is like building a house. The first thing you need for a house is the foundation. The foundation for your musical house or Byzantine chant is not the notes and rhythms. It is your posture, your breathing, or I guess your breath support, and your mouth opening. These three things are the fundamentals for your Byzantine chanting or your singing in general. If you do not have these things, your house will collapse. I don't care how much music you know. I don't care how many notes you know. I don't care how many pitches you can read. I don't care you know, how well you can interpret the thoras. None of those matter if your breathing's bad, your posture's bad, and your mouth opening's bad. You see people who are like, oh, you have to flare your nostrils when you sing. People who say that, don't listen to them. Most likely they've never had any sense of real classical training, so they should really be avoided in general. Um, people who you know, open their mouth like this when they sing, not the best resources for chanting. I have never heard anyone in the classical genre ever say to sing like this, or sing like this. You, these are things that people who make up their own theories and own techniques make up. You really shouldn't listen to them. And honestly, the proof is in the pudding. If they sound bad, probably it's because their technique's bad. So that is the foundation. If you do not have this foundation set, you need to go and really practice and hone in on these skills. When you practice chant, your warm-up should not be just running into music and singing music. Your warm-up should include actual vocal exercises and breathing exercises that reinforce good habits. And I have a lot of videos on my channel that talk about all of these habits, not habits, more like techniques, that I highly recommend that you watch. Um, your pedagogical skills are extremely critical to maintaining not only a good tone, but also maintaining a uh, healthy voice throughout your singing career. Having good technique prevents vocal injury. This is not just with vocals, it's with pianos, uh, with guitars, with cellos, with violins, with woodwind instruments. All of these things are very important. So why should we ignore them for Byzantine chant? We shouldn't. Do you know any concert pianists that can't play their scales? I mean, I don't know any of that can't. All music uses scales. Do you know any violinist that can play a violin concerto beautifully and perfectly without knowing any of their arpeggios? You don't. Neither do I. Because they have to know these skills. So those are the fundamentals. The next part of your house, your musical house, is the beams and the wood and the roof. So like when you have the actual skeleton of the house, this is the notes and rhythms. You cannot build a house without pitch uh, stability, right? If I have wood that doesn't work and notes that don't work, because the foundation's wobbly, the whole house is going to fall. If you don't have good breathing, good mouth opening, and good posture, everything that you put on it, notes and rhythms, doesn't matter because they won't have the support to maintain its structure. So once you have the fundamentals down, obviously it takes more than 20 minutes. It takes you know months and years and years to work on it. But again, you're building a house. A house doesn't take two days to build. It takes a couple months to build. So... In addition to the notes and rhythms being right, you have to make sure they have the support they need to hold themselves up. Let's say you're not careful with your practice. Your notes and rhythms are wrong. It's the equivalent of having a house, but the roof is tilted that way. And one side of the house is like this, one side of the house is like that. Or you have a house 
where you're supposed to have even beams, but you have two beams that are full and then two beams that are lower and then, you know, just have this in alternating patterns. This is not a stable house, right? The notes rhythms are important, but they have to be built on top of a good foundation, all right? The next thing, once you have the actual roofing and you have the scaffolding done, you can't just sleep in that house. It's going to get cold. There's no waterproofing. You're going to get flooded. Animals will come in. There's so many different things. You know, there's no door. You're going to get robbed. The next thing you have to do is the phrasing. How am I going to phrase something? Meaning, what is the shape or contour that I want to give a melodic line? What do I mean by this? Shape and contour refers to both your dynamics, your fluctuations in tempo, not fluctuations like da 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 just slight variations in tempo that just make things sound even. If I sing a scale, ma 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 ma. If I sing everything evenly, it sounds like this. Ma 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 ma. It feels like it's jumping some places and falling back some places. Right? You have to give a little bit of variation just to make things a little more even. So you have dynamic, you have some fluctuations in tempo, not extreme, just little bits just to even things out. And then you have the mood. The mood is very important because it can greatly change how you interpret a piece. For example, let's look at Christ is Risen. If we take the hymn, Christ is risen from the dead. Pretty neutral, right? Nothing weird there. Just a simple, calm, normal. Triumphant. Christ is risen from the dead. More triumphant sounding. Or you have said. Christ is risen from the dead. Different moods. And they can greatly change how you chant something. If you want something that's more contemplative or more reflective, I have... Christ is risen from the dead. Trampling. Different moods invoke different phrases. If you want to enhance your music and add the walls and add all the different lightings and fixtures to your house, you need to look at the phrasing. Another hymn I want to look at is just a simple opening for um, a tone five uh, doxasticum. If I look at uh, glory to the father, if I sing it monotonously and bland, this is how it sounds. Glory. What's wrong with that? Well, the notes and rhythms are right. The breath supports are right. But... It's, it's like I'm not paying attention to any of the notes. I'm not actually setting up the mood for the piece. Look at this. Glory. Just that has so much more sensitivity to it. And that really sets up the mood of the piece. Because in addition to the glory to the Father... Providing the tone, it provides the mood to the piece. If I sing, Glory to the Father and to... It's a lot more smooth and contemplative. So the mood is very, very important. And this is part of the phrasing. So the phrasing, which includes dynamics, the tempo, and the mood, all encompasses the house, as in the, the paint as in the hardwood floor or carpet, it could be the roof, it could be different materials. A lot of things change. Maybe the outside's out, made out of brick and not wood. Maybe the outside's made of stone. There's so many different things you can do to change the mood of your music. But if you choose to only make it wood 24-7, 365, all, uh, every time you sing, what happens is that all of your music sounds the same and your house looks boring. No one wants to live in a boring house. 
You want to live in a house that reflects what you want it to reflect. You want to make music that reflects what you think the music should reflect. If you've never thought about chanting as a reflection of the music and the text, then you've never looked at chanting as the way it was intended. So I know in the beginning of this of the video I talked about the church fathers. You know, um, there's a reading from Saint Paisios in one of his spiritual councils where a nun is telling him, Every time I sing from music, I feel like I'm not actually praying, I'm not prayerful. And I think this is a common complaint a lot of chanters have. Whenever I sing something, I always feel like I'm never actually praying. I'm just singing music. And this is a very common sentiment. Sometimes I feel like that. And the reason why this happens is because we're so focused on the notes and rhythms. We forget to actually look at the text. And we forget to look at how the music was written to amplify the text. A lot of times it just takes us to take a step back and really reflect on what we're singing and how the music reflects it. You know, my father was just telling me that, um, you know, he has all the Arabic hymns memorized. And he was just telling me that for him, just reading the text um, and using that to sing has made him not only understand the text so much better, but also interpret the text through singing so much more effectively. And he feels that he's unlocked a new sense of, to his chanting because he's looked way past the notes and rhythms and looked at the actual meaning of the text and how to express it with his voice through phrasing, dynamics, tempo, and mood. So the next thing we have in a house, once we have the roofing done, the flooring done, the walls done, it's like the electricity and all those actual appliances. This is like the ornaments. Ornaments are things that don't apply to the structure, but make the house functional. Uh, when I piano, classical music, there's some ornaments, not too much. Maybe there's a trill. Baroque music, there are a lot of ornaments that can be used. Romantic music, again, some ornaments. Jazz music, a lot um, of ornaments that you can use. In Byzantine music, we have so many ornaments. But if I interpret every ornament the same every single time, it's the equivalent of me taking a house and painting the whole thing black. Everything looks the same. There's no difference in color, no variation in anything in uh, angular wise. You know, colors can change the atmosphere of a room, can change the temperature of a room. If I paint my whole house black and just use the same paintbrush for everything, my house is going to be boring. Same thing with music. If you use the same ornaments every single time, it's going to get boring. Every time I see the, um, you see the kandimata on top of the oligon with the sifiston, and I sing it da 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 instead of da 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 or da 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 da. There's so many different ways to sing it. If I sing it the same way, da 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 da, it gets not only repetitive and boring, but starts to get obnoxious. So you have to make sure that you vary your ornaments, and as well as the timbre of your voice. The color of your voice can really change a lot. If I sing everything like this, you'll get very fed up. If I sing everything, the style doesn't work. And you're not actually taking into consideration the text or the affects you want to evoke. But if you vary your timbre so that every single note is different, it will really, really help enhance your singing. Now, the last thing is a couple of bad habits that tend to happen because we lack the knowledge and sensitivity that comes with musicality. So, um, let me give you an example. A lot of times people cut off phrases short. So if I'm singing a song like, um, if I sing like that, it's a whole line. If I sing, if I cut the phrases short like that, the whole thing sounds off. Same with Byzantine chant. If I sing like, while the stone was sealed by the Jews and the soldiers were guarding thy most pure body. Now, that is a bit excessive. But if I cut off phrases short, that happens. If I sing something like, 
let oh um it sounds excessive oh um if i give the time for the music to actually breathe then i have time to breathe and it doesn't feel like it's cut off so cutting off phrases short some people might do like oh whenever you have a plus sign it's not oh it's an oh Oh, uh, it's a lift. It's not a pickup. It's a lift. There's a there's a difference there. Oh, 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 oh. is so much more smooth and comforting than oh, 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 oh. That's very very unsettling, not comforting. The next bad habit that really prevents us from achieving musicality is over accenting words or notes. So if I have the oh at the end of a phrase, if I do it like oh 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 oh, I or if I'm at the end of a phrase like Christ is, again, it sounds very ugly, and you might think you're adding something, but in reality you're just taking away from the music. You don't need to add extra extra accents. The music already has accents built in. If you add extra extra accents, you really take away from the chanting. The next thing is being too bouncy when you sing sometimes it's nice to have some bounce like christ is risen from the dead add some extra bounce and energy to it but if you do, christ is risen it sounds excessive what i'm doing right now but some people actually sing like this when you add too much bounce and too much ho, 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 you really hear it and it really makes the music sound kind of like St. Paisos, I mean, I just like him because he uh, talks about chanting some of his books. It's like a anvil hitting, uh, hitting on a hammer, right? Very ugly in sound. Let me get the camera to focus again. There you go. Um, and then one of the, the biggest things is not listening. When you sing, you have to actively be listening and adapting your voice to reflect. You have to have a system that is working. If I have a car, I have to make sure the engine is running. And is actively being monitored by the computer. It's like, um, you know, playing piano. I can't just memorize everything and just uh, muscle memory everything. That takes away everything that I've worked on musicality-wise. I have to listen and really adapt to every different thing and different change that I want to give. Same thing with singing. If I'm not listening, not only will your pitches be off, but your musicality will be none. I know a lot of chanters, um, you know, in person. I've listened. I've heard. A lot of chanters online, I've heard. A lot of big name chanters too that simply do not have a sense of listening to when they sing. They're singing, um, if they actually listen to it, they wouldn't post recordings. They would go back and reflect and actually fix it. If you, um, and this is a big piece of advice I give. If you want to know if you're doing well in your chanting, record yourself. Go back and listen. Is this something, one, that you would publish online? That's one that's one scenario you can look at it. Sometimes maybe I'm not that good. Two, is this something that I want to present at church? If the answer is no, you need to take a step back and look at the drawing board. If it's because the notes and rhythms are too hard, pick an easier piece of music. You're not ready for that. If it's because you're not having a good foundation, you need to actively look at how to fix your foundation through daily practice and exercises. If your music sounds flat, bland, there's no energy to it, go back and fix it. You know, a good way to get ideas is to listen to good chanters. You know, a lot of the chanters I listen to are um, from the Arabic world or the Greek world. Um, English world, I don't really listen too much just because I, I get very critical. Um, I'm very much in, because uh, I teach singing, I get very analytical with people singing English. But in Arabic and Greek, there tends to be a lot of very, very solid chanters. So usually I like to listen to them for um, ideas or different um, inspirations. Another nice thing to listen to is choirs. Choirs have to agree on how they interpret things. Usually the conductor, the protopselty, gives the um, command on how to sing something. But a bad choir has everyone singing how they think it should sound. In reality, a choir has to listen down to the protopselty and match his framework. Otherwise, the choir falls apart. That happens a lot. So, uh, the way I recommend that you add musicality to your singing. One, 
take a hymn that you know well by heart. It could be Christ is Risen. I'm using this just because it's part of the season. Um, it could be um, a doxastikon that you know. Doxastikon for Pascha. could be a cherubim you know. Look at it. And then after you've learned the notes, because you already know the notes probably, look at how you could sing this in a way that would match the mood you want. What is the character you're giving to the piece? You know, if I'm going to chant Christ is Risen, am I going to chant it in a mood of like a patriarch leading his people to victory? Am I going to chant it like a, a little child who is maybe excited about Pascha? Maybe it's his first Pascha that he can remember. Am I going to chant it like someone who just converted to the faith and is now an Orthodox Christian who is moved by it? There's so many different characters you can add to it. Am I going to chant it like an 80-year-old man um, who is reflecting on the past? Am I going to chant it like a 20-year-old guy who's very ambitious? There's so many different things you can add. Am I going to chant it you know, like a, a woman who just lost her husband? Am I going to chant it like a husband who just lost his job? There's so many different things that you can add to it. But it's up to you to choose how you want to interpret it. So... Obviously, um, you know, when I sing something, it's hard to look at every single piece of music and give it the same analysis and the same love and, and criticism that you can. But this is where listening comes in. When you listen when you're singing, you allow yourself to look into the music more deeply and listen and hear what parts you want to bring out more. If I just sing the last phrase building into the next phrase, the next phrase has to be the climax of that phrase has to be the high end of that phrase. And therefore, I can fall down and not lose energy, but maybe just um, lower my dynamics more, maybe soften up my voice a bit more on the way down. So there are so many different things that you can take into consideration. Now, I hope this doesn't come off as a harsh video, because in reality, this is a struggle that might present itself for quite a while. Because currently, in the, at least we have, uh, we have in the United States, there is a lack of masters proto Celtics. I'll put master in quotes because, you know, um, the only person we can call master is maybe the uh, bishop, but and then of course Christ. But um, you know, if you don't have the influence of a master proto Celti, then what happens is that you don't really have a framework of what you can work on. Therefore, you have to actively search after different musical ideas and frameworks that you can apply to your singing. And remember, use your ear. If a chanter sounds bad, has bad habits, don't listen to them. You will develop bad habits. If someone is offering courses on Byzantine chant or singing technique, and their singing is bad, they sound bad, they don't have much good training, maybe they've only studied singing for like a couple weeks, that's not enough to teach a course for singing. You know, I've, I've taught um, singing for the last two and a half years, three years, and I've studied singing for eight years prior. You know, I've entered the competitions and I've won. And the proof is in the pudding. You know, I wouldn't win competitions if I didn't know what I was talking about. You know, one of the other reasons why I'm studying music now is to learn how musicality and different ways of expression can apply itself to ecclesiastical music. And all the stuff I'm telling you now is stuff that I've always done. But through going to school to learn it, I'm able to put it into words and package it in a way that allows us to utilize it in our own singing. So hopefully this video is something that inspires you to go out and to not sing music in a monotonous manner and allows you to try and sing music in a way that reflects the text and reflects the glory of God. So I hope you found this video helpful and interesting. Um, if you did, you know, I'd really appreciate if you shared it with someone or liked and subscribed. Also, don't forget to join uh, the intermediate class. Um, again, this class is something that I think is invaluable. The price is so low at $90 for the course. I mean, most courses probably cost three times that and you get less lessons, less content. Um, and because the money is going to the church, we don't really have a, uh, a profit um, game working. It's mostly just money to help the choir um, function. So because of that, um, we're able to keep the prices low and we want to keep the quality, you know, the highest we can, you know, the highest possible. You know, 
this is a this is um, kind of the birth of the new school of music that um, that I'm starting the Nativity of the Theotokos School of Music from um, St. Mary's in Hunt Valley, Maryland, and a lot of what we value, at least um, when I say we, it's kind of my framework that I've worked with um, my father and with the priest on, is that Byzantine chant should not be something that is only looked at for utilitarian purposes. Byzantine chant is not something we use so that we can sing the services and that's it. It is something that we should use to ascend to the glory of God and use that to help others ascend and find the faith in that. Because if you look at the conversion of the Slavs, it, they were uh, most taken aback by the beauty of the church and the liturgy and the music and the iconography and the incense. If we don't preserve that beauty, we don't preserve the church. And this school of music, um, when I say school, I also mean idea and school of thought um, that I'm presenting, is, is something that I think is necessary in order to preserve our culture and to stand against a lot of the things that push back against the church today. So, um, thank you for watching. I hope you have a blessed rest of your Paschal season and a blessed Ascension on Thursday. And have a great day.